All right, so if you would please just take a moment to let all that stuff that is clouding your mind go, because it will be there when we're done today, if you need to pick it back up. And give this time to the Lord. We're going to start by singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Can you please stand with us? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you. I Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, 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 to see. strange <laughs> the next song is the days of Elijah these are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord when we get to the bridge it says over and over again there is no God like Jehovah which is a mispronunciation of Yahweh but we speak English and we know what it means right there is no God like Jehovah. If you believe that, sing it and sing it loudly. If you don't believe that, please don't sing it. Just listen to the beautiful voices. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word are the days of your servant Moses 
This last song is As the Deer.
Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you are. I thank you for the way that you show yourselves through the people in our lives. I pray that you would draw us closer to one another and closer to you. I pray that you would help me to have the right words to speak this morning. Father God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. But before you sit down, if you want to say good morning to each other. Now, if you do not wish to be hugged, just make sure that you make that known. morning another beautiful day there's a strange glowing object in the sky that I can see at the moment I've heard about it before doesn't show up very often in this part of the world it's just a little bit less elusive than Sasquatch I believe it's pronounced suin the Sun the Sun that's it all right anyway Ah. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That is from Acts 10, 15. As we're continuing on through the story, through the story of God and man together, I have been kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I've had to slow down for the book of Acts a little bit. And I believe I have one more sermon in the book of Acts after today. And then we'll be on to the epistles. Possibly. Hopefully we're not rushing through too much. But I'm hoping that by Lent, I'll be able to do a nice Lent. And, not Lent. What am I looking for? Advent. Thank you. By Advent, I'll be able to do a nice Advent series and then start something else. I'm hoping to be through this by Advent. So, and it, that's the, the great news about preaching through the Bible is you know you're coming back because I have nothing else to work with. Nor do I need anything else to work with because I barely have a handle on so little of Scripture. <sighs> Anyway, I'm in chapter 9 of the book of Acts, where we actually come across one of my absolute favorite biblical examples, and I say that about a lot of people, particularly in the New Testament. Saul, Paul, Saul, Paul. This is the conversion of Saul, and I can see myself in Saul, as I'm sure many of you can. By show of hands, how many of you absolutely love Orthodox Christianity? You're like, I don't even know what that means. All right. I love historical Christianity. It brings me so much joy. I love reading about the traditions and the history and learning what proper Christianity should look like, right? As someone who gets caught up in the uh, bylaws and the traditions, because I have that, I can relate to Saul quite a bit because that's all Saul was fighting about was he's like, this isn't okay. We do it the way our fathers did it, and their fathers did it, and you need to stop. So, granted, I think I have a little bit better, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, moral high ground by clinging to Orthodox Christianity, because it's Christianity, and he's fighting against Christianity. But at the same time, 
I feel that that gives me a little bit of a window into the mind of Saul. So I'm at chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priests and asked letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I'll explain that term in a second. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. There's a term I said I would come back to. Is it, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Again, I didn't know what that meant for the first 35 years of my life, probably. Why do you kick against the goads? I just know that that's a silly thing to do. I just didn't understand what that actually was. Uh, apparently, on a cart, there used to be this board with spikes on it so that the animal wouldn't kick back against it and damage the cart or the person in the cart. So they would just learn not to get bumped by the spikes, the goads. So kicking against the goads is why are you hurting yourself? Why are you doing something stupid? And if you have a different interpretation against kicking against the goads, please tell me. I was just so excited to have more meaning to that phrase that I just swallowed that right up. I'm like, yes, that'll work. But why do you kick against the goads? It's such an interesting imagery of kicking against that which causes you pain. It's causing you pain to fight against something. It's interesting. It's so human. <laughs> well, perhaps not if it's designed for mules and oxen. Perhaps it's not just a human experience. Now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and children of Israel, and the children of Israel, sorry. For I will show him many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once and arose and was baptized. So when he received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. I can completely understand Ananias' um, nervousness about going to see Saul, because Saul has letters with him saying he has permission to arrest believers to bring back to Jerusalem for trial. He's causing trouble amongst believers. He's terrifying. He is persecutor number one for Christianity and the world. And God tells Ananias in a vision, I want you to go see Saul. This is not optimal. 
This is way outside of anybody's comfort zone. I don't think God works that way. I could see someone saying that to him. Be like, you're going to see Saul? I don't think God would do that. Yet he did. <laughs> I also love that it says that Saul was immediately baptized. How many of you have, ever no have never noticed that phrase before, that Saul was immediately baptized? Anybody? You're like, no, we caught it the first time. That's okay. What I love about Saul is he apparently was just wired in such a way that he was either on or off. He doesn't seem to have a middle ground at all, which also I enjoy about Saul because I seem to have some of that same wiring about myself. I have two settings, fully engaged or not there. Immediately he preached the he preached the Christ in the synagogues and that he is the son of God. So immediately he went from cursing the cute, the church immediately. He is preaching about Jesus being the son of God immediately. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem? And he has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot came, became known to Saul, and when they watched the gates day and night to kill him, then the disciples took him, sorry, then, yeah, then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Some translations say, and then his disciples let him down the, through the window in a large basket. Saul is part of this rabbinical system. Saul was a, a Tal, Talmud. He was a disciple of Gamaliel. And so now he has disciples of his own. This is how his mind works. This is how you teach people proper religion as you show them in every aspect of life. So I love that it already is talking about Paul's disciples. <laughs> It's like, let me show you. This is amazing. And if the weight of that is lost on you, don't feel bad. It just makes me happy. And perhaps it will you as well, just at a different time. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. I've seen tiny glimpses of that when you have someone who's like a high figure in society or just someone that's more pop culture. When they come to faith, you actually have this outcrying of, well, prove it. You wrote that song about that stuff. You can't be a Christian. I'll believe it when I see it. When I see the fruits of your faith, I'll believe it. Now amplify that immensely to someone who's actually a massive persecutor of the church. If you had one of, the, uh, one of those atheists that goes around debating Christians trying to prove science over faith, if you had one of those guys suddenly come to faith, that would just be close, not quite. All of a sudden comes to faith, you'd have a giant outcrying of, well, I don't trust that guy. He's probably making fun of us. This is a little bit more severe because I don't trust that guy. probably trying to have us all arrested or find out secrets about us or have us all killed. Now Saul can worship over there. Good for him, but he can stay over there. Verse 27, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and how he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. It 
Isn't that magnificent? That's actually what everybody is striving for, I think, is that verse. People talk about how they want to find an Acts 2 church, which I agree, everybody wants to find an Acts 2 church. It just depends on how you interpret Acts 2. Um, but everybody wants an Acts 2 church, but people don't really talk about an Acts 9.31 church where everybody is unified, and there's peace, and it's multiplying. Because I think deep down, that's really a desire that I have, because I would love us to be in unity with every church down the road here where we could all function together, which we have in short glimpses, where we all function together and there's peace. And the people of God are multiplying. That sounds nice. I'm not saying that not everyone agrees with that. I don't know anybody that would stand up and say, no, I don't feel that way. I don't know anybody that would say that. But at the same time, I've just never heard anyone say, I want one of those Acts 9.31 churches. <laughs> Maybe I'll start saying that anytime someone says, I'm looking for an Acts 2 church. Well, I'm looking for an Acts 9.31 church. Anyway. <sighs> now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelled in Lydia. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went to them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. I love that imagery. Uh, I just did a funeral yesterday, so it's very fresh on my mind. Um, but you notice that when someone passes, people have a tendency to have these things that meant so much to that person. Right? Yesterday, the gentleman had the license. The, the casket with him because that was such a huge part of his life you know he, he that was and people don't do that for that person they do it for the people that are there watching I think you know but it's interesting to me that even in scripture they're showing everybody these things that she made oh look at how beautiful look at the seam here she was so good at her craft you know and I'm sure I still have quilts that my great-grandmother made that I could point out and be like, my great-grandmother made this, see? I have some knockoff cabbage patch dolls that my grandmother used to make, too, back when they were cloth. I don't know if that's illegal or not, but she got away with it. She didn't make any money off it. I'm sure she lost money on it because she made them for the grandkids. But I still show that to my daughter and be like, hey, great grandma Johnson made this. She never met great grandma Johnson. It probably loses a little bit in translation. But it's important to me. But I love that all her friends are like, oh, look what she made. She was great at this. It's the same. It's the same now as it was then. But Peter put them all out and he knelt down and he prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. So in Acts 9, we actually go from Paul, who is persecuting and converts miraculously and sees Jesus... And then we switch over to an account of Peter, 
where Peter is going through the countryside and he is doing miraculous signs and many people are believing. And I am going to uh, try to get through chapter 10 today. I may not go verse by verse, but I might. Um, because even if I stumble through my words and I'm having a hard time putting ideas together, because I'm human, I truly am. I am disturbingly human. I know that. But if I'm having difficulty putting together words, God doesn't have that same problem. So if I'm using his words, I know that it doesn't return void, and I know it still has value. So if I'm having a hard time coming up with things to say, let's just stay with Scripture for a minute. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, which means leader of a hundred, if you didn't know that. Cent means a hundred. It always means a hundred. Cent a meter, there are a hundred of those in a meter, Correct. Cent, there's a hundred of those in a dollar. Century, a hundred years, right? A centurion is the leader of a hundred soldiers. If you didn't know that, you just learned something. Okay. There's a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. And I want to make a joke about, I wonder where they were from. But he, he was a centurion from what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and who prayed to God always. There's a subsect of people during this time called God-fearers that did not become Jewish, but they did worship the God of the Jews. And they followed the three basic rules, I believe, where you don't eat meat uh, that was strangled for idols, and, um, oh goodness, there's two other ones. You refrain from sexual immorality, and the third one's a big one, but I'm having a hard time remembering it. But they had three basic rules that they had to follow. And those people were known as God-fearers, which I have every reason to believe that that's who, what Cornelius is. He is a God-fearer. He worships the God of the Jews, though he himself is not Jewish. Okay. Because I always had assumed before finding out that information that everyone who wanted to worship the God of the Jews became Jewish. But there is a subsect of people that did not do that. And that would be Cornelius. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a, de a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. <clears throat> the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour when he became very hungry and wanted to eat but while they made ready he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open and in more corners descending on him and let down to the earth in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth wild beasts creeping things birds of the air and a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. This vision that Peter has in the trance of the meat sheet, the sheet coming down with all these different animals and critters on it. And the voice that says, rise, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, I can't do that. I don't, I don't do that. I'm good. People that do that are bad. I'm good. In essence, that's what he's communicating. And God says, don't call anything that I have cleansed unclean. Now, I find a lot of 
comfort in this verse on a dietary level because I enjoy eating pork. Pork may be the perfect blend of every other creature as far as meat taste is concerned. It's wonderful. In fact, Christianity is the only major God religion that allows you to eat a pig with a clear conscience. So, magnificent, right? As much as I love that context when I apply it to this verse, there's something bigger going on here than just whether or not I get to eat pork ribs. Right? Something far larger is going on here. You have people who are not clean. Cornelius is not a member of the church. He is not a member of the body of believers. He is not Jewish. He is not Jewish. He is every bit as un well, maybe not every bit, but he is a, as unclean in the same ballpark as the Ethiopian eunuch we've already discussed. Right? Not only that, he is a Roman centurion. He is not a prime candidate for religious conversion. He is part of the oppressive force. Right? He's part of the oppressive force. The people that are holding you down and taxing you. He's one of them. This vision, do not call anything unclean that I have cleansed, happens as Cornelius is sending men to Peter to bring him. Because God has revealed to Cornelius that he needs Peter. Peter is now being told by way of, I don't even know what would we call this, analogy, allegory, vision, that God is saying, whatever I call cleansed, don't call it dirty. There's a bigger picture here than the food. We're looking at people. Because what happens next shows us that Peter got this message. Because Jews don't go into Gentile houses. Because they're not clean. There's actually a division you make socially between Jew and Gentile. You just don't mix. Even if you like each other, you stay away from each other in certain circumstances. And I also love... This was done three times in verse 16. I know I've said this before. If you hear something three times, you remember it. If you hear things three times, you remember them. I'm told that if things are said three times, you're more likely to remember them. This was done three times. And the object was taken up to heaven again. So just in case Peter didn't hear it the first time, or in case he's like, well, maybe I imagine what he said. He heard it three times. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, because I don't know if he was sitting there wondering if that means he's supposed to eat something different for lunch, because he's hungry and they're making him food right now. And God is telling him what, you know, rise kill and eat I wonder if he's sitting there wondering if this is the time he's supposed to try rabbit meat or what's happening because he doesn't have the context yet but God's about to give it to him a lot of times you have really strong feelings about things and God doesn't put you in a position where they matter for years but Peter's about to get this right away in verse 17 is which was where I was at Wondering what this vision meant. Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius made inquiry, to, inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. I'm sorry. The Spirit said to him, I'm sorry, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So the Spirit tells Peter that he has sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had sent, been sent from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he which you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, 
a just man, one who fears God and who has good reputation among all nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. I find this kind of interesting, too, because Simon the Tanner, I would assume that he is also Jewish, just let a Roman soldier stay at his house. This is huge, but we just read it as a byline because we're in a different culture. This is enormous. That's crazy. How many of you would allow, and I realize that it is not the same context, how many of you would house a North Korean soldier tonight? If one just happened to show up looking for a guest already staying at your house, how many of you would say, come on in? We gloss over so many things that are a huge deal. A Roman soldier just stayed in this man's house. Anyway. And the following day they entered Thessaria. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him because he didn't get it. An angel has told him, quite miraculously, to send for Peter. So when Peter gets there, he falls down and starts worshiping him because he doesn't really understand. He just knows, God sent this guy. I don't know if in his Roman mind that that makes Peter a god or half divine or something like that. But he doesn't know how to respond. So he does what he knows. And he's corrected for it immediately, which is good, but that wasn't the end of it. Because I know sometimes when we see someone doing something very unchristian when they're new to faith, we have a tendency to really blast them. Not correct them and lovingly restore them or show them a different way. We have a tendency just to yell at them and let it be, because how dare you? But he's doing probably the most unchristian thing on earth, which is, you know, starting to worship a human being. And all Peter says is, well, I'll read what Peter says. Stand up. I myself am also a man. That was the end of it. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another, uh, yeah, of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Again, I've heard a lot of people reduce Peter's vision of that sheep coming down from heaven to be all about, and that's why we're allowed to eat pork. Maybe. But that is God declaring that no man that he calls cleansed is unclean just by virtue of where they come from which is fantastic news for us. Scripture makes so much more sense when you keep it in large chunks because there's context. There's always a context by which God is speaking or into which God is speaking. And if you don't have the context, you can really do a lot of damage with individual verses. I think we can see that culturally because I'm of the generation of Sunday school that got individual verses with lessons, right? Almost every Sunday school after me up until very recently where it started to shift back, we taught kids a morality lesson with a single Bible verse. A lot of kids these days don't know basic Bible verses because they haven't been taught them. A lot of people my age don't know basic Bible verses be or Bible stories because they haven't been taught them. They know um, isolated single scriptures, and it's a shame. It's a shame. However, if you did learn Sunday school from the Abeka cards of death, you know what I'm talking about. The giant Abeka card with a story, then you know Bible stories. Also, if you had a gray-haired lady with a felt board, you know Bible stories. Those felt boards were amazing. 
one of the churches I went to as a kid had a green felt board with all the Bible characters. And it was interesting how many different roles that one guy would play. It's like there was a certain man. <laughs> Be like, isn't that the certain man from the other story? Sorry, hopefully that didn't cost you anything. Anyway. <sighs> Therefore, I came without objection. As soon as I was sent in, or I was sent for, I ask then, for what reason you have sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. I like this, too. I like, that's maybe a very generic way to put this. I enjoy that when Peter shows up, they said, tell us what God wants us to hear. They are ready to hear. They're ready to be preached to. He's gathered his family about him. And it's like, all right, he has some answers. We are going to hear about God. Let's go. That's exciting. I don't know if you've ever had that experience at church where someone was just there and was like, all right, now tell me about this Jesus. I want to know. I came pretty close to that once at vacation Bible school. Otherwise, I have not seen that experience at church, any church. I've been to a slew of them. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Hmm. In truth, I perceive God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteously is accepted by him. Do you get how awesome that is? Just those two verses together. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. That's amazing. That goes, I, I don't want to say it goes against, but that changes everything for us, doesn't it? The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized 
who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. This is a very, and I know this word gets used a lot for what I'm not meaning, but this is a very inclusive section of scripture where it said, oh, by the way, you too. And maybe that isn't by the way. In, in uh, Sunday school, we were looking at Galatians and Ephesians this morning, regardless of the typo I made in the bulletin. We were looking at Galatians and Fe Ephesians this morning, and it showed how Paul was trying to unify the church of all these different types of believers, how we were all included in this multi-ethnic church that God has built. And it actually shows how that was God's actual original design was for all of us to be under his lordship. But it's, it's a beautiful thing to read these accounts and to see people's preconceived notions fall away. To see that the Holy Spirit falls on this Roman centurion, quite literally the enemy, is converted and filled with the Holy Spirit. So can someone be an enemy whilst being your brother? Or did being an enemy just go away? Did they get a higher mission than trying to preserve this homeland? What takes priority? Are we trying to unify the church of Christ between all peoples? Or are we trying to preserve what we have? It's an honest question. There's a lot of denominations. Funny enough, I agree with almost all of them in ways, and I disagree with almost all of them in other ways. And I make jokes about some of them because some of them are delightfully uptight. Others just happen to be members of my family. But I wonder sometimes of if this sex, all these different sects of believers that we have, and I know I don't pronounce very well sometimes, all these different groups of believers that we have and that we've built up and that we elevate amongst ourselves or try to disassociate with amongst ourselves falls into this a little where we... Uh, we don't feel that they're necessarily in the club. Now, granted, there are groups of people that are just cults or absolute heretics, and I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about, talking about the church, those who believe in Christ the way we believe in Christ. Should that not be enough to have unity? Should that not be enough? There's things I think are non-negotiable. I'm with you. I really, I really do. But when I read sections of scripture like this, I can't help but feel a little bit convicted. Just because I know in my mind, being human I make those lines I make those classifications we we classify by nature we really do it's why we survive you can look at a certain snake and know that it's poisonous for Don and I we can look at a snake and know we want nothing to do with it anyway God didn't curse them on accident I'm kidding, sorry. I don't like snakes. I, I really don't. Dylan loves snakes. He loves Jesus just as much as I do. We're both believers. I value him highly. I don't understand why he likes serpents, but he does. And that doesn't make him less of a Christian. I'm just saying. I have weird prejudices sometimes in my own head based on my human experience. Based on the way that I classify things. We can look at things and understand, well, that's dangerous. We can look at things and understand, well, 
if there's three people walking together at night and they're all male, male and large, and I have the opportunity to stay to the well-lit street or I can go down the dark street, which are you going to choose? Didn't we just judge them by appearance? Well, we did. So I'm not saying that you can help this. We make judgments, and some of them are the reasons why we stay alive. That part's good. But we also have a tendency to make judgments just based on, well, I like this. That's weird. I don't like it. About the quickest way to disengage me from worship is to bring out a flag of any kind, whether it's an American flag in the sanctuary or someone twirling a flag in worship, which apparently is something churches do. I've been present while that happens, and I'll tell you, I don't even know what songs we were singing after that point. I was having sensory overload. I was trying to figure out whether that was heresy or okay. I don't know. My, the, my inner Pharisee had a meltdown. I didn't know what to do. Are they wrong? I don't know. Are they worshiping God? I believe so. Was that wrong? Probably not. Did it distract me to the point where I couldn't worship? Absolutely. <laughs> but was that me? Was that the Holy Spirit within me warning me? Or was that just me being like, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I still don't know the answer to that. I still don't know the answer to that. But I know that I have a tendency to judge people who, even while following scripture, worship in a different way than me. Or follow a different style of orthodoxy than I do. What I know for certain, there is one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's what I know. That is non-negotiable. I, I, that's non-negotiable. If you're a Christian, just by very title, you have also agreed that that is non-negotiable. Although there's many people who claim to be Christians that don't agree with that statement. I judge them. Hopefully rightly. I don't treat them badly. They've just entered that section of my brain like sinners and tax collectors where I feel they need to be converted. It doesn't mean I hate them. I just don't feel that they're saved. I don't believe they are. There is one way to the Father. Jesus said that. He was speaking of himself. But here, in Acts 10, we have a group of people that don't belong who are putting their faith in Jesus Christ and who receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and are immediately accepted and baptized. And the Judaizers amongst them, which is a beautiful term that means you've got to be a Jew first, which I get that. I get that style of thinking. You need to follow the orthodoxy and then God can use you. I get that style of thinking. I truly do. But even those among it said, well, I guess they need to be baptized. I guess they're with us then. We have a very big God who chooses to use people. And if you read scripture, it chooses to use people that do not deserve to be used of God over and over and over again. And thank God because I get to be a pastor now. Because I don't deserve the grace of God. And honestly, none of us deserve the grace of God. It's his unmerited favor. There's something else that we see in this, in this section of Scripture, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I wrap it up. I love the way Peter preaches. It doesn't say much about what he actually said. But he just simply presents the gospel. He just simply presents the gospel. At no point does he say, and all your problems go away. Try on Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He doesn't try to make it more friendly to Roman ears. He doesn't try to make it culturally relevant. He doesn't try to do any of that. He presents the gospel as it is. And the transforming power of Christ works.
There's a huge push right now. A lot of church services actually start by singing a secular song from the radio to make people comfortable with being at church. What an absolute exercise in futility. That drives more people away from church than it brings in. And I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. That is not why people came to church. That is not why God wants us to come to church. It isn't to make people feel comfortable. I don't even know that church was intended to be a great evangelistic outreach. This gathering here, please invite your non-believing friends, but that isn't what this is. Evangelism happens in the world where we interact with real interactions, with our real and genuine faith. And here we're worshiping Christ together. And if someone is converted in our midst, praise God, that is amazing. But that isn't our primary focus. Let's win people to Christ, but let's win people to Christ where they are. If we're fortunate enough to get them to come here so we can do it, amen, but come on. Anyhow, that is what I have for you today, plus two or three bonus points I didn't mean to say. If you would please, and are able to do so without pain, would you stand with me for a moment? Father God, I thank you for your words in Scripture. Father, I pray that anything that was from you would resonate in people's hearts, anything that was of me, anything that was pep theology or of less importance. Pray people would forget it quickly that we would focus on your inerrancy and your love and your promises, that we would go forward and build your kingdom for your glory. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. That brings us to our time of announcements, prayers, and sharing, and also playing the part for congregational hymns of volunteer will be Kay Ann 